Good evening, and thank you for joining us. For our blind and low vision attendees this evening, we are going to be describing what we look like and what we're wearing to give you a sense of, of what, we, what we look like. Um, my name is Kristen Motti. I'm an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library, and I'm really happy to welcome all of you here with us this evening. I am a white middle-aged woman with brown hair and highlights, brown eyes, and I'm wearing dangly earrings and an orange top. Judith Human will be joining us this evening to speak about her new books, Being Human, which is a memoir, and her new book for children, Rolling Warrior. And so we're really excited to hear more about those in just a few minutes. Joining her in conversation is Kristen Joyner, who is her co-author. Before Judith and Kristen join us, just a few items of housekeeping though. Many of you are probably familiar with the Zoom webinar space, but just in case if you're not, in case if it's new for you, um, your cameras and microphones are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So you can use the Q&A button, the box at the bottom of your screen to type questions in there for Judith or if you have any questions for us behind the scenes. You'll see relevant links shared out in the chat throughout the program. Closed captioning can be toggled on or off by the CC button also on the bottom, the live transcript button. So you can turn that on or off from there. And copies of Being Human and Rolling Warrior can be bought from our bookstore partner for tonight's talk, our neighborhood bookstore Trident Booksellers in Boston, but they will ship free media mail nationwide so you can check them out or check your local library for copies of these books for tonight's conversation. Now just a little bit about tonight's guest author and our moderator for the evening. Judith Human is an internationally recognized leader in the disability rights independent living movement. She has served in both the Clinton and Obama administrations and she was the World Bank's first advisor on disability and development. Her story was featured in the Netflix documentary, Crip Camp, and she is the author of a memoir, Being Human, and the new Rolling Warrior, the incredible, sometimes awkward, true story of a rebel girl on wheels who helped spark a revolution. Joining Judith in conversation this evening is her co-author for both books, Kristen Joyner. Kristen is a writer and an activist whose writing on exclusion, inequality, and social change has been published in several magazines and journals. We are really grateful to have both Judith and Kristen with us this evening. Now, please join me in welcoming Judith to the podium. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So very nice to be with you and I Really want to thank the Boston Public Library for putting this on. And Kristen, you should come forward. <laughs> so um, Kristen and I, Kristen Joyner, who will now magically appear, there she is. Um, we were very lucky to get together about five or six years ago now in uh, putting in writing Being Human. Um, I, some of you may know I'm a disability rights activist. I'm 73 years old. I'm a white woman. I use a motorized wheelchair. I have brown hair, which goes a little bit under my ears. I'm wearing gold Mexican earrings. They're not really gold, but they're gold color. And my blouse is white and it has uh, flowers and around the bodice, um, different colored triangles, uh, green, red, purple, and kind of gold. We're in my foyer, and uh, which has pictures on the wall, postcards, um, some plants, and our dining room working area for my company is behind me with a floral tablecloth and lots of plants. And uh, it's been an honor to be able to work with Kristen. We'll get Kristen J. Kristen Joyner. Um, a number of years ago, for many years actually, people had been suggesting that I write a book. And it was something I thought, oh, that would be interesting. Why do people want to know my story? But as I got older, more people were suggesting I do it. And I really didn't have the confidence to write a book on my own. So I was very lucky to be able to get an agent who 
help me find Kristen and we'll talk about that more later. Kristen. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here. And um, just a little bit, I'm um, wearing, I'm blonde, uh, middle-aged, white. Um, I've got shoulder length, kind of wavy hair and I'm wearing, I'm actually in New Zealand right now. So I'm in winter and I'm wearing a navy blue sweater turtleneck. Um, so um, as Judith was saying, it was really a, a really amazing opportunity for me to be able to collaborate with, um, with Judith on her memoir. And I wanted to kick off um, tonight by asking you to talk a little bit, um, Judy, about that process. What was it like for you um, to write your memoir and for, for us to work together? Well, what's interesting about this process is Kristen and I didn't know each other. Um, we spoke on the phone. I had read some of her materials and agreed that I'd be interested in meeting with her to learn more about her and to see if we had kind of the right um, connection to be able to embark on something as big as writing my memoir. And um, so we met here in DC. Uh, we went to a local uh, Middle Eastern restaurant and uh, had a pretty lengthy discussion, which I think was um, pretty down to earth, learning more about who we were. Kristen doesn't have a disability. And uh, so that was really one of the issues that I wanted to talk about because, you know, writing a book with someone that not only didn't have a disability, but actually, and she can talk about that while living in Berkeley uh, before she eventually moved to New Zealand. Um, she really didn't know much about what was going on in the disability community, although she'd been involved in other movements. And I thought that was intriguing and also that I'd really have to develop a trust relationship because I didn't want to be putting a book forward that you know, the, my co-writer uh, was not going to understand some of the major issues that I was going to have to put forward. And I think for me, one of the um, interesting components of what came out of this is that I learned how to be more direct. Some people laugh at my saying that, but Kristen and I, in the beginning, Kristen was living in San Francisco and traveling to DC. So we met each other a number of times. And then the job that she had in DC, she uh, left that job, went back to San Francisco. So everything was then on the phone. And then she and her family moved to New Zealand, another day, another time zone. And so, you know, not being face to face with someone. And I think this really is like, many of you can relate to this because of COVID. I really liked the face to face see you, touch you interaction, it feels more real to me. We didn't have that, but we had been able to develop, I think, an important relationship over the time that she had been in uh, Washington, D.C., um, which is where I live. And so over the course of writing the book, and as you can see, uh, for both versions of the book, the adult version and the young adult version, it starts when I'm younger. And so some of the stories are very intimate and I really had a specific way that I wanted things done. And I, as I said, I'm much more a speaker than a writer. Chris is much more a writer. And so I also had to be learning from her about her style of writing, how she needed to kind of go by herself and write. And then I could look at what she'd written. So we would talk. She would write, we, I would read, we would edit. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it was a very healthy uh, relationship um, that really, I believe, made us both stronger. And I think Kristen, like me, we also had to figure out this right balance of how to be supportive and critical in a loving way um, to be able to get the book to come out like it did. 
Yeah, it was definitely a learning experience on many levels. Um, I think probably for both of us, um, like Judy said. Um, I, I So I wanted to ask Judy, I want to ask you another question, but before that, I do just want to say one of the first questions that Judy asked me, um, Judy, I think you remember this, when we sat down for lunch on Connecticut Avenue was, why do you, you know, so you've worked in feminism and um, human rights your whole career, but you didn't really, you weren't really aware of this and the disability rights movement. And I said, yes, that's correct. And then she asked me, why? Why is that the case? And basically, you know, the next three to four years were spent um, trying to figure out the answer to that question. Uh, still answering that question. Um, I think it's really a significant uh, outcome for people reading the book and or the books, as well as um, watching Crip Camp the um, film that you can get either on Netflix or on YouTube, which um, I'm one of the prominent um, people in the documentary. And the film first appeared in Sundance or at Sundance. And one of the main comments that people made, and there were thousands of people who saw the film at Sundance. It was shown 12 times. I was at about five or six of the showings. And um, people ask, why didn't we know the story? And I think like Kristen, who lived in Berkeley and took the BART most days, and the BART was right at the Ed Roberts Center, which was a big office of disabled people's run organizations. How come people didn't know the story? And I think, you know, it's a combination of the lack of visibility of disability, the lack of knowledge. And my comment to the documentarians was, how come you didn't tell the story? Because you know, you're know you documentarians and you do a lot of films on civil and human rights. And what is it that you didn't see or value um, in the message from, in the multiple messages from the disability community? I think that's really, one of the critical issues that people need to discuss for either by yourselves or in book clubs or however you do it. But I think that's really one of the predominant issues. My book and other books that are out there telling people's individual stories, um, I think are really important because you get a view on how I and other people view themselves in society. And I think what you see in our book is really um, a lot of the pain that goes on on a regular basis, but how myself and many other people, this is not just a disability issue. I think it's a feminist issue. It's a black issue. It's a brown issue. It's a Muslim issue. It's an indigenous people's issue on and on. Um, how do we balance uh, being able to tell our story in a way that people will listen and hopefully listen in a way that can be impactful for them so that they individually can make some changes in the way they think and act. And these are very complex uh, issues. And I really think there is a common thread across the board. Uh, why do, we, why do we not know? Why do we not be inquisitive? And I think right now, you know, with what's going on in some of the states in the United States on uh, issues around voter suppression and around issues of suppressing, telling the history of various groups, um, I think the failure to really accurately portray history as difficult as it might be means that we are creating generations of children and adults who are refusing to look at the facts and are refusing to listen to the voices of people who have been adversely impacted um, by our history and global history. This is not just history in the US, it's a history in every country around the world. So Kristen has asked me to um, uh, read the prologue of our youth book, 
Rolling Warrior, the incredible, sometimes awkward true story of a rebel girl on wheels who helped spark a revolution. Um, just a quick note that um, the adult version was done by myself and Kristen. And we had some people read as we were going along, but we didn't have an advisory group. And Beacon, which is the publisher for our books, um, had had other um, advisory groups for youth books that they've published. And so we decided to put a youth group together, uh, which Kristen uh, and I were involved in. And actually with my neighbor, who's right here, stick your face over here. Hello. This is Jasmine. Jasmine was one of the young people on the um, committee. Okay, so I'm going to read the prologue. The thing to know about me is this. If I'd been born just 10 years earlier, I was born in 1947, and my parents hadn't left Germany when they did, I would have been killed by Nazis. Hitler considered us, quote, life unworthy of life, end quote. If you were a young disabled person in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, the doctors recommended that your parents hand you over to a special children's clinic where you were either starved or poisoned. When the Nazis expanded the program to include older disabled children, the doctors experimented with gassing them. 5,000 disabled kids were used as a means to test new innovative ways of killing masses of people which meant that we were the experiment for a campaign that was responsible for the systemic dehumanization and murder of almost 20 million people. My Jewish grandparents sent my father away from Germany before World War II, when he was 14, to go live with his uncle and two brothers in Brooklyn. He never saw his parents again, but in some way he was the lucky one. My mother was only 12 when she was sent away to live with people she'd never met. She never saw her parents again either. I guess that my grandparents on both sides were worried enough about Hitler to send their kids away, but didn't think it was going to get as bad as it did. A lot of people didn't know how bad it was going to get. So you can see why when I got sick at one year old and it became clear that I was never going to walk again, and the doctor told my parents to put me in an institution. My parents were like, no way. Institutionalization was the status quo for people with disabilities when I was a child in 1949. You and your parents weren't even encouraged to, sorry, you basically got put in a building, looked after by nurses, and your parents weren't even encouraged to visit you. There were all kinds of bad things happening in the institutions to people with disabilities, which nobody was talking about. It wasn't until I was in my 20s in the 60s that it came out that disabled people were getting locked up, beaten, starved, and used like guinea pigs for medical experiments. We were considered mentally and physically defective. Disabled kids brought stigma to the family. People thought when someone in your family had a disability, it was because something had been done by somebody wrong. Years later, when people would say that we didn't, that we did change, sorry. Years later, when people would say that what we did changed the world, I said this, all we did was refuse to believe that we were the problem. In order to understand what really happened though, let me tell you a story about what the world was like then. Before we mobilized our army, took over the San Francisco, federal building and face down the US government. So I'll begin at the beginning. Thank you. Um, Judy, this is, and we, we talked a fair amount about this um, in, your hall, in the hallway of your apartment building, um, but you know, clearly you, you came from a very um, traumatic and um, intense background. Your parents were refugees from Nazi Germany and they had both been orphaned by the Holocaust. So I guess one of my first questions would be how, how is that background? I know it has, um, but can you talk a little bit about how your background and that aspect of your identity has affected you and your activism? 
So I would say in a number of ways. Um, one, it's always important that I, that I know that I'm Jewish and I know my history. And it's always, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I am so astounded by legislators coming in and saying, you can't tell the history of slavery in the US and other really important issues. And I know there are some people that are saying the same thing is not happening around discussions regarding the Holocaust. But for me, you can't tell both stories equally well because they're very similar. And you know, in Germany, they figured out a way as they got a little bit further away from the Holocaust itself to begin to have these painful discussions of what did we do and why did we do it and why did we let it happen? And I think it's really the same thing. If we don't learn from our history, we will repeat it. And um, many people have said that I'm certainly not the first one to say this. And so um, for me, being able to also recognize that the discrimination against disabled people at that time and still today is not being discussed in a comparable way to discrimination against others, which is very um, important to look at because that means that black disabled individuals and brown disabled individuals, indigenous, et cetera, who have multiple components to who they are, um, just like me as a disabled Jewish woman, parts of their background are not able to be discussed. And it is very important to be able to bring our whole selves forward. So for me, I think one of the issues of my growing up was really also to see my mother and my father, but my mother in particular, being involved in the neighborhood association when in the late 60s and 70s, the banks were involved in redlining. And I know this was an issue in Boston too. And you know, my mother was um, on a neighborhood association and fighting against the banks that were trying to destabilize our communities and not allow black families to buy homes in this middle-class neighborhood. So my parents were my role model. Um, television, um, magazines, um, newspapers, radio, being able to learn the story of what was going on in the civil rights movement, in the women's movement, in the anti-war movement, uh, really allowed me and others, and I, when I say me, it's always me and others, to learn from others and to look how they were coming forward and really had been creating a movement, but the movement was now becoming more visible. And I think many of us had such deep respect for what was going on within the civil rights movement, uh, where it was bringing, it was organizing. It wasn't just bringing together the black community, but it was bringing together the interfaith community, labor unions and the women's community and many others. And so really what we look at in the book and in the movie, and as many others tell the story is the emergence of a disability rights movement that in many ways was trying to partner with all these other groups. And those partnerships didn't come about the same way it did in other areas. And um, I think, you know, things have gotten much better and disability, I think in part um, because Actually, of- Oh, sorry. Go because ahead. of the ADA and other laws. And as the disability community got stronger, it was reaching out to other movements to say, this is who we are, we would like to work with you, you work with us because disabled people come from every sector of society. That's, I really want to, sorry, I, I wanted to um, jump in with a question because that's a really, that place, that, the, the, your conception and your you and your team and the group of activists that you work with really conceived of yourselves as a, a movement. Um, and that's such an important part of this work, as you were saying. And, um, you know, but we live in a culture that really tends to venerate the individual and the individual soloist who succeeds. And your story is really about the opposite. In fact, 
when you were at the 504 sit-in, which those of you who haven't read the book yet, is the longest takeover of a federal building in US history. Um, it happened in 1977. Um, you were very clear um, about your belief in, it, in your insistence on sharing power and creating a sense of transparency and equality to the point where, for example, in your meetings where you had 150 act, you know, 150 of the protesters all gathered in one room, you would um, insist on the meeting not ending until every single person had a chance to speak, um, which meant that sometimes your meetings lasted until three in the morning, um, you know, that lasted eight or nine hours. So this really spoke to, to me, this is really sort of at, at, at this time, you know, sort of a countercultural philosophy where, you know, it's about, you are doing something very much together in creating a movement. Um, what, what gave you that, um, can you talk a little bit, what gave you that faith in movements and in working together rather than, you know, the solo kind of um, heroic individual? I mean, that was like nothing I ever could have done. And maybe it's because, you know, people um, you know, see me as kind of always being strong, but I am the kind of person that needs to have people around me who I trust. And it's always kind of a strategizing with people who I trusted and trusted me. And we would really have discussions about where we were and what we needed to do and the importance of this or that. So it kind of, you, you couldn't be solo. You had to be a part of the group. And then we created the group. Um, and so, you know, we brought people in who had different disabilities from different backgrounds and really had a vision of articulating what discrimination was and having a goal of fighting discrimination and becoming members of society. And um, now today, you know, we called it the disability rights movement, very much modeled on the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the anti-war movement, et cetera. And now people talk about the um, disability justice movement and things, you know, evolve over the years, which I think is very healthy. And um, at that point, I think, you know, the movement really started earlier, although I don't think we were really calling it a movement until the 60s and 70s. You know, you had the veterans organizations, you had different categories of disabled people, but frequently, you know, muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, polio, whatever it was, it was really focused on cure and care. And we basically said, um, we're not looking at cure. We are looking at things like sign language interpreters and readers and personal assistants and physical access and ability to work and go to school, not based on discrimination on and on. Um, and that we didn't want to be divided. And so that was really for everything that I've done in my young and adult life. It's been focused on that. And the reason why I think we, I don't think our meetings ever really went eight or nine hours, but they did go many hours. And the reason why it was important to have everyone speak is we needed to keep relative harmony in the building because if people felt like they weren't being respected and they were only pawns, then they wouldn't have stayed because it's not like we, we're in this great environment where everybody had their own room and a great bed and food. No, people were sleeping on the floor, you know, in this big conference room. And I was sleeping with a couple of other people outside of the area where the garbage was brought in and out. It was a smaller area, but, um, and we had all kinds of committees and the Black Panthers and Delancey Street were bringing food in. So we had food every day, but it was, you know, very basic. It was nutritional that it was very basic. There weren't a lot of choices and people were staying together because we wanted these regulations for section 504, which was a provision 
that was comparable to a part of the Civil Rights Act and basically says, if an entity is receiving money from the federal government, it may not discriminate against someone with disability. And defines disability, it looks at what discrimination is, and it looks at what remedies are. So it was something that we had been working on really from 1972 until finally in 1977. And it was very important because people had been involved in the development of the regulations. And like everyone knows, you know, when you're developing something complex that cuts across things like universities and public education and state and local government and transportation um, and hospitals, that there are gonna be a lot of people who have opposition to what this law was going to do because it was going beyond the kind of discrimination that was illegitimately having occurring with black people, for example. You know, uh, Rosa Park went on a bus, sat in the front and refused to get off the bus. After a year of boycotting, they changed the rule and black people could sit any place on the bus. But if you had a disability and you couldn't walk, whether you were black or white or whatever, you still couldn't get on that bus because that bus wasn't accessible. And so there were differences. You couldn't just say, you couldn't discriminate like you did in race. You had to say, not only couldn't you discriminate, but you had to move forward. You had to look at things like designing standards for buildings. You didn't have to make every building accessible overnight. But if you were building a new building, you had standards to follow. If you were renovating a building, you had to have follow those standards. And even if the building couldn't be made accessible, you had to ensure that people were gonna be able to uh, obtain the same benefit. So whether it meant a store where someone would have a doorbell and you would be able to have someone come out and tell you what was in the store in order to buy it, it couldn't just be invisible. Um, so major changes and captioning um, and sign language interpreting and ramps and bathrooms, on and on, and not discriminating against people who had intellectual disabilities or other forms of disabilities. Very significant changes that ultimately came about because of 504 and then the ADA. I think that was really, you know, one of the brilliant shifts that um, the, the movement that your movement and the and and you and the activists created was that. Um, Prior to that movement, there was there was a sense that that there, the idea was that as you you know that if a person had a disability and they couldn't get on the bus, that was because that was their problem because they couldn't walk, and so it, it sort of affected everybody by in, they internalized their disability as I can't access society because I have a disability, and your movement turned it around and said actually it's a civil rights issue. The problem is not me it's society. So we need to redesign society because disability happens, can happen to anybody at any time. And so we need to design society around it. So you I, mean, really I think that's a very important point, the last part that you were mentioning, and that is most people acquire their disabilities as they get older and failure to really um, recognize that disability is a normal part of life ultimately means that as one acquires a disability, you're not prepared. And you know, it's not that you can ever be prepared for something like acquiring a disability that could impact um, you know, a number of aspects of your life, but at least you should be able to know broadly that there are disabled people in your community and around the country. You need to see us and learn about us in advertising and television programs, in movies, in documentaries, in uh, magazines, in social media, on the internet, on and on. And while that's happening a little bit better, it's really not happening yet, in my view, as much as it needs to happen. So we have a bunch of questions here. I wanted to ask you, we have one sure. time for one last question before we go to the audience questions. Um, 
which is that, and I think it's very pertinent to today's conversation around faith in our democracy and faith in government, because you could have, one could imagine that you could have in today's age turned around and said, you know, of today's age of entrepreneurship, if you were say Jeff Bezos and you had a disability, you could have devised some kind of technical solution and then sold that to <laughs> millions of people. But instead you really focused, you had faith in the government and faith in democracy and said, let's, we need a systemic solution for this. Yet you came from a country where the government had completely broken down into an authoritarian society. So I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what gives you faith in, in democracy and the government um, over say technical solutions, or not over, but why you prioritize that and where you see that going today. So I guess the way I look, there are a number of ways I look at that. One is I'm not a designer of things like accessible buses and standards for ramps and uh, medical equipment or whatever it may be. But I, I believe that finding out who those people are and working with them and you know, bringing the composite of what we need for a solution. You know, I'm a very big believer in there are many people who need to come together to make solutions. So for example, I don't know how to make captioning, but I presume with all the intelligence we have that people do know how to make captioning. And so was I saying, no, let's, you know, let's take five of my best friends who don't know how to do this, but, and, and let's try to do it, which we know would not happen. We need to go, we needed to go beyond our circle. And we needed to say, who's involved with technology and what are they doing? And what, and what we learned over time was why was captioning not a feature that was being built in to the Microsofts of the world? And when I was working in the Clinton administration, one of the things that we were doing, Microsoft was coming out with its new software in 1995, and it was not going to have um, accessibility in it. And we sent someone, one of our grantees, who was very knowledgeable in this, out to Microsoft to work with them. And so if you look at the software for 1995, and then if you see Microsoft, for as an example, has done some great work. They have about 70 or 80 people with disabilities working at the company on accessibility related issues, probably more at this point. But it was, you know, I feel the last four years for me were really difficult. Um, and I have to say, you know, now there are a lot of difficult things that are still going on. I think there really has been a seed that has been planted to distrust government. And, um, you know, I had 20 years in the nonprofit world before I worked in the Clinton administration. Um, and for me, it was always important to work with government. Um, and it was important to be honest and forthright and try to come to compromise when it was appropriate. But like with the 504 issue, there was a point where we would not um, tolerate any changes. And I've got many examples of things where we just came forward and said, no, we're not doing this. You're not going to do it and we're going to stop you doing it. And some were little and big things. But I feel right now that we really, really, really need to be getting people to, you know, look at there is a role for government. People want the potholes filled. People have got to be getting more afraid of what's going on with the environment. And some people need to be understanding that this is not, you know, I'm a religious person, but I very much believe that, you know, God says you have to deal with it. You know, we have free will and we need to exercise that free will. And if we don't exercise that free will, we're really abrogating our responsibility. And so I, you know, I feel like I do definitely believe in democracy. And we really need to be fighting hard for it, harder than we ever have before. Thank you. I, I wonder if we, we can go 
to the um, to the questions from. I know we have a number of questions from. Uh, One of the questions here is, "What has been your biggest inspiration?" Um, uh, seeing the circle of disabled people growing, benefiting from laws as imperfect as it's happening, but people who are much more knowledgeable and are really um, infusing uh, their views into a much broader sector of society, in employment, in education, um, in technology, on and on. And where we now do have people who are not just um, aspirationally looking at what does it mean to have an accessible building, but people who are studying in architecture and medicine and various fields of technology and on and on who have a view as a disability rights person and infuse their knowledge um, into the various circles that you know now accessible buses, accessible trains, accessible buildings, um, even accessible planes are something that we're able to look at happening uh, more in the future. Um, and job discrimination, ending job discrimination. You know, and there are things like before the eight, I'm sorry, before 504, there were virtually no disabled doctors as an example. But today, you know, you're seeing a not huge, but a growing number of disabled people who are becoming doctors. And that's really important. Um, not only because it's just basically important to be allowing people who meet the qualifications to become doctors to do that, but they also have knowledge as disabled individuals and I believe can in many ways provide better medical care um, in their areas especially than someone that doesn't have the lived experience. And I think, you know, healthcare providers that have different disabilities and different racial backgrounds, different religious customs, all of these things are really very important in being able to provide not only top-notch medical care, but also being able to understand the cultural diversity of populations, which in many ways can really adversely affect the ability to provide the healthcare um, inventions that have occurred. So things are very you know, interwoven and so I think there we've seen some very important things happen. And that does make me believe that we can continue to move forward and really look over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years um, at society being better. And I look at other movements and see progress they've made and progress that they haven't yet made, not because they're doing anything wrong, but because of things that we're seeing going on now um, around our country and in many countries around the world. I mean, we're looking at the fact that there are fewer democracies, that countries that had gone from, you know, Soviet control, for example, to now being back to autocracies. Those are things that we need to be looking at. And we need to see whether or not we're a model that really embraces and demonstrates what democracy is. Right, that's, a, that's, that's, that's actually a very good um, lead into one of our questions from our, one of an attendee um, where it says, in Crip Camp, um, I was so impacted by the partnerships with the Black Panthers bringing food and members of the LGBTQ community washing hair and supporting. How do you think we can continue to build and sustain partnerships like these in our advocacy work? It just needs to be a part of the DNA. I mean, the Black Panthers were involved as I... Okay, I just wonder, you know, you could talk really, this was one of the things that struck me when we were talking was how you very specifically identified those groups and then went to their meetings. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about... I will. Actually, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So I think if you look at why were the Black Panthers involved? The Black Panthers were involved because Brad Lomax, who had multiple sclerosis and likely didn't have it in 1968 when he was involved in helping to stand up the Black Panthers in Oakland, 
uh, was involved with CIL and was involved with the planning committee for the 504 demonstrations. So he went to the Panthers and talked about the need for food. So I think that was why that happened. And when we looked at other groups like the labor unions, um, the interfaith community, it was in part because the disability community, even though we were small, when there were issues that came up and there were many besides just 504, we would engage those communities because um, we very much felt that this was something that we couldn't do by ourselves. And we also wanted to be involved with what they were doing. So our overall mission was to do that. So, so why was the LGBT community involved? Because there were many people in the building who were from that community and they had friends. And a lot of this was friends or people we had worked with, you know, the labor unions, it was machinist workers union that came with us to Washington DC that rented the van that took us around every place. Um, and there are many, many examples of this and how you do it, it has to be conscious and it has to be genuine. People really have to believe that you don't only want them to work with you, but you need to work with them. What are they doing that you can be supportive of? And how can we also help these other organizations learn more about disability so they can be integrating disabled people from these different communities also in the work that they're doing in a genuine way? hiring disabled people, putting disabled people on their boards, you know, whether or not the organization has anything to do with disability. Um, it always should. So Did yeah, you, I mean, it's just natural for me. It was, it was, it was, it was. I remember um, I told you guys I was in my foyer. So <laughs> welcome to my house. It was a very conscious effort. I, I wanted to have, there's one comment here. Um, Karina writes, I am forever grateful to have had 504 accommodation in school, just graduated from Harvard and will continue working for fighting for equity in education. Um, Harvard is a great example. Harvard, the Ivies. So, <laughs> you know, I think Harvard has been doing good work. They've got some great people there. Um, who've been fighting for Harvard to continue to do better work in the area of disability. So I definitely want to take my hat off to them and to people who are working on this issue. But the university still has a long way to go. Um, and I think, you know, they've had some very good professors there and have some very good professors there who have disabilities, who are uh, dis teaching around disability studies. And um, I think the university itself is slowly doing a better job, but the university gets federal money. The university has been obligated to be in compliance with section 504 since 1973. And uh, I remember in the mid eighties, I had been asked to speak at the law school and I couldn't go to the bathroom because there was no accessible bathroom in the law school at Harvard. Um, and you would hear students who would be coming into the dorms where the dorm wasn't accessible and they would be making things accessible as students came in as opposed to doing things proactively. Um, Harvard, Yale, you know, the Ivies. And I guess they're doing a much better job. And as I said, hats off. But the reality is these schools need to see disability the same way they're seeing other diversity issues. And they need to see disability as a part of all of the diversity issues. Disabled students and faculty are assuming, and I don't mean this in a light way because we know it's an incorrect assumption, but the issue of accessibility and working these issues out should be finished. People want to be learning about disability as it relates to our academics. And there is too little going on in the academics around disability and the inclusion of disability in areas like disability studies. 
and the inclusion of disability studies within queer studies and black studies and Latino studies, et cetera. It's moving forward, groups like Society for Disability, the Society for Disability Studies and other groups are working on this, but we need to be putting our foot on the gas. And I don't know who it was that made that comment, but thank you. <laughs> we've, got, um, we've got just about four minutes left. Um, and one last question is about conservatorships um, in the news and Britney Spears. What's, yeah. what, are you, what's, what, what would you like to see come out of this raised con consciousness, consciousness? So I also, I also do a program called The Human Perspective. It's a podcast. You can listen to it on Spotify and on Apple. And we just taped um, a program last week on this issue. It's going to come out either later this week or the beginning of the week after. But we had a, a woman with a disability who um, had been under guardianship and was able to get out of guardianship as one of the people that we interviewed and the person, one of the people that worked with her. And we had uh, two other attorneys, uh, one who's from Pennsylvania and one in DC, who've been doing a lot of work on the issue of guardianship and trying to prevent guardianship and help people look at ways of setting up natural supports. Um, I think guardianship it, it's very unfortunate what's been going on with Britney Spears, but it she's really um, through her ability to be you know more forward in what's happening, she's really allowed others who've been doing work in this area, particularly around people with mental health disabilities, older people, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to have the issues that they've been talking about for decades. Um, there's much more work that needs to be done. And I think we were making a point earlier, it's really important that people who don't think of this issue need to look at it because today, you know, you may not be having uh, needs where you need other people to be supportive. You don't need to be under guardianship or conservatorship in order to have a circle of people around you who can help you with you as the center of what's going on. And we need to learn about it and prepare. And quite frankly, Massachusetts is a state that is very progressive, has some very good laws in the area of disability, in the area of personal assistance services and others, other areas. So there's a lot to learn from organizations. And I don't know if the library ever does this, but it might be great to do a panel where people from the Boston, Massachusetts area could come in and talk about some of these issues because there's a lot to be learned. I think that, um, I think that wraps us up on the questions. Do we turn it, should we turn it over to you, Kristen? Sure, if you'd like to, thank you very much for your conversation, Judy and Kristen. Thank you for sharing your very powerful story. And all of that information um, gets us to, to think for sure. Uh, I'd also like to thank Katie and Travis, our ASL interpreters for tonight's program. And thanks to you, our audience, for asking such great questions and for being here with us. There will be a recording of this conversation available on the Boston Public Library's website shortly. A reminder that if you'd like to buy copies of Being Human and Rolling Warrior, you can visit our independent bookstore partners, Trident Booksellers here in Boston online. The link is in the chat and they will mail na um, nationwide free media mail shipping or visit your local independent bookstore or your library. To find out more about programs, resources and services for all at the Boston Public Library and for all ages, please visit us at bpl.org. And in just a moment, we will highlight three upcoming author talks that we have coming up next. Can I just say one thing, Kristen? Sure, Judy, thank you. The, sorry, the book is also on audio. Great. So you can get the book on audio and it's read by a woman named Allie Stroker. And Allie um, is a disabled woman. She um, is an actress. She was the first wheelchair rider to perform on Broadway, and she won a Tony Award for her performance in Oklahoma. So um, for those people who prefer to listen to the book, as opposed to read it with your eyes, 
um, I'm sure you can also, uh, you can get the book, the audio version. And I assume that the library may have copies of the audio version too. We do, we usually do, I will check in just a moment, um, but we do have the link to the library's copies there in the chat for anyone who's interested. Um, thank you again, Judy. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you our, to our ASL interpreters and thank you all for joining us. Um, we do hope to see you either at an upcoming virtual talk or um, we hope to see you in person at one of our library locations soon. Thank you for joining us and good night. Good night, thank you all.